Hello, good morning. Um, it is Petri here on Talk TV, live from the Talk Radio studios. Until four o'clock, it is the 2nd of June and it is also Thursday. Um, now it's time for us to head over to uh, speak to Ross Feingold, who's an Asia political risk analyst in Taiwan. Because while we've been paying attention this side of the globe, what's been happening on the other side? So let's find out. Ross, good morning to you. Morning, Patrick. Good morning. Now, we have, like I said, we've all been looking really very closely at Ukraine and Russia uh, and the shooting in America. So our attention has been well diverted uh, from what's been uh, going on in in uh, in other areas of the world, like in, in uh, Asia and, and the Far East. So uh, let's have a chat about that. What's happening in um, in Shanghai? Well, they say they're opening up this week, so you, we have to keep in mind how enormous Shanghai is, um, uh, not necessarily geographically, but by population, 20-plus uh, million people, many of whom have been locked down for a considerable uh, amount of time over the past couple of months. Initially, there was a lot of media coverage about difficulties people had getting food uh, supply, uh, people running out of food. There was a lot of media coverage about people shouting out of their windows in, in protest at being locked down. Somewhat unusual uh, for China, of course, to see that kind of public protest. Interestingly, that, that kind of news seemed to have disappeared, uh, maybe because the authorities cracked down or maybe because they did improve the logistics of, of delivering food so people weren't as grouchy. Uh, but anyway, they say they're opening up. But w when I use the word they say, we have to keep in mind that, yes, people could emerge from their homes. They'll probably be returning to their offices or their factories. And, and of course, the economic aspect is very important to all of this as well. But they're not implementing something uh, where Western Europe or the United States have moved to, where we're getting away from mandates and, and vaccine passes and things like that, or, or uh, restrictions on the number of people who could attend events, et cetera, et cetera. So life uh, is not quite returning to normal in Shanghai. It's emerging from the situation that it's been the last few months. But there's still going to be a lot of restrictions uh, or, or compliance requirements like mandates, uh, masks or proof of vaccination to enter venues or workplaces and things like that. Uh, so definitely not returning to normal or business as usual, but uh, at least they're emerging from the lockdown. And there's another important thing to keep in mind about this, whether it's Shanghai or Beijing or any other large uh, city in, in China, they can re-implement this at any time, right? That, that's still where they are uh, from a policy approach. So if there is an outbreak, they might start with the neighborhood where it occurs, uh, but in China that could still mean locking down millions of people given the, the size of some of these cities. Uh, so that again, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. They can say a big city's opening up, but they could very rapidly reimpose these restrictions because, again, that is their current way of dealing with COVID outbreaks. Yeah, just to clarify, is is China really attempting to go for a zero COVID policy? We've kind of gone the opposite here. And most of the, the rest of the world has, has gone the opposite. But yes, in, in China and in Hong Kong, to a large extent, that is still the policy approach. And uh, you know, there's not much space to disagree. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's not like they have an opposition party in parliament that, that is going to uh, question the prime minister. Uh, so that, that remains where they are. And that's why I said it's very important to keep in mind when we read the news this week about Shanghai opening up or Beijing opening up, that these kinds of very strict measures, locking down neighborhoods or parts or all of the city, could be reimposed a, as rapidly as they removed it uh, if, if there is another COVID outbreak. And when we say opening up, it, it doesn't mean that I could pop over there, does it? Could I, could I come and visit? That's another Sorry. important thing to keep in mind as well, that there's still uh, nearly a, a blanket ban on, on foreigner entry uh, for people who are allowed to, to enter the country, such as returning citizens. Or if you do have a, you know, if, you, if you're going there to work, it might be possible to arrange for you to take up your new post. But even that 
uh, is still very, very difficult to obtain. Uh, but yeah, there'd be significant uh, quarantine requirements upon arrival. So travel has certainly not resumed normally for China, whether that's inbound foreigners trying to get into China or outbound or uh, Chinese nationals trying to leave the country. Uh, let's have a look at a place where we can go, a couple of them, Japan and South Korea, S- sort of opens up to tourists. What do we mean by sort of? Yeah, so there's some good news here. If, if uh, the audience wants to visit Asia, they can look at visiting South Korea and Japan. The reason why we say sort of opening is there, there's still a number of requirements. Uh, vaccination, for example, uh, Japan has imposed a cap on the number of tourists. I expect this to, to rapidly change as, as they get comfortable, as long as there's not uh, an outbreak of COVID among tourists that, that enter the country, they'll probably raise those caps uh, very, very frequently. You have to go with a tour group. So it, it's not free and easy travel on your own. Uh, you probably need to book with a travel agent. But if, if people really want to get on a plane for 10, 12 hours and go to come, come out here to Asia, yeah, go talk to your travel agent. You can go to South Korea and Japan this summer, so definitely start thinking about it. But just keep in mind there still might be some uh, hurdles to comply with, maybe sort of similar to what you saw in Western Europe uh, over the past year that have now been done away with. Uh, they have not been done away completely for parts of Asia. Thailand's another example as well where there's a lot there's, – there's opening up, but there's still some things to comply with. Singapore, uh, as of now, they're not even uh, requiring a a test upon arrival. You do need to have vaccination proof. Uh, So various uh, restrictions or or compliance uh, items still exist in different countries in Asia. But yeah, uh, people should start talking to their travel agent and think about visiting. And uh, the other thing that we've not really been... Uh, well, I think we take an eye off the ball a little bit, is uh, the, 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 the issues between China and Taiwan, or rather China has with uh, Taiwan. Um, uh, has anything happened there? Because it, it's feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Well, on on, uh, Monday of this week, uh, China had 30 of its military aircraft enter what Taiwan calls its air defense identification uh, zone. Uh, People often confuse that with with the airspace of Taiwan. This air defense identification zone is basically a big box on a map that Taiwan government has drawn around Taiwan Island. It extends quite a distance from the actual island itself. And they say, this is our ADIZ. You got to identify yourself if you're military aircraft or we're going to chase you out. Uh, And China has basically gotten to the habit of ignoring it or just to uh, poke poke it at at Taiwan. They'll, They'll fly a bunch of aircraft through a small sliver of the zone, and then it becomes a big headline here. The government says, oh, you know, how can you fly into our zone? China says, it's not your national airspace. You drew that zone unilaterally. We, we don't recognize it. Uh, but 30 aircraft on one day, it's, it's not a historical high, but it is considered a lot. It is considered provocative. And Taiwan has to respond. They have to fly their own aircraft to chase away the, the, the Chinese aircraft, give them warnings and say, you're in our zone, get out of our zone. Uh, it's a, some aspect is a bit of a, a political drama, uh, but it is very, very dangerous. There's a very serious aspect to this. You know, aircraft uh, up in the air from both sides, accidents, misunderstandings can occur. And, it, and the, the, these 30 aircraft from China that were in Taiwan's air defense identification zone uh, earlier in the week, that, that occurred hours before a U.S. senator landed here in Taiwan for, for a three-day, two-night visit. Uh, U.S. congressmen, uh, senators, members of the House visiting Taiwan is not unusual. And it's not unusual for European uh, members of parliament to visit Taiwan or Japanese members of parliament to visit Taiwan. That's all pretty routine. But every time it happens, China gets very, very angry and criticizes it and says, you're not supposed to have inter- uh, official interaction with Taiwan. You agreed you wouldn't do that. Right. They say this to the governments. But the, the, the interesting thing there is what, what, what the, the, the Chinese side seems to miss is when these are members of parliaments, they're usually coming at their own volition, right? They're, they're not there on, on behalf of the executive branch of the government. And that, that's the, the, the kind of the, the nature of democracies, that the parliaments and the executive branches are somewhat separate. And members of parliaments or Congress, in the case of the U.S., they're going to do whatever they want. There, there was some concern, wasn't there, when the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine happened, that China might 
in some way use that to make a move uh, against Taiwan. Uh, is that still a concern in Taiwan, or or do you think that they they actually just couldn't do that? They wouldn't do that. I, I frame the concern this way. Uh, it's not so much that China is going to uh, take the opportunity with the world's attention diverted to you know, the attentions on Ukraine right now. It's not necessarily that China is going to uh, take that opportunity and invade today or next week or, wa or while the battle in Ukraine is still ongoing. And let's all hope that there could be a ceasefire and some resolution as quickly as possible. Uh, but but the, the concern is really that China is learning some lessons here. So not just the battlefield lessons, but also how the international community responds, sanctions, for example. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, it, it's what could be learned from how the world responded. What could be learned from how the Ukraine military responded? What could be learned from how uh, the Ukraine military adjusted to deal with the Russian invasion? That's what China is learning from all these events. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, let's talk again, Ross. Uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, for joining me this morning. Ross Feingold there, uh, Asia political risk analyst.